So we're ready to get into the Word. Amen. All right. I want to share with you quickly this morning, I think one of the most misinterpreted scriptures in the Bible. I think it's also one of the unbelievers' favorite scriptures. Not John 3.16, by the way. And it's not Psalm 23. If you had to ask what's the most well-known psalm, it would definitely be Psalm 23. But I think, I think this year is probably one of the most popular scriptures to the unsaved or, or unbelievers. And it's from Matthew 7 verse 1 where it says, Do not judge or you too will be judged. That's their favorite verse. And the second, second most favorite is God helps those who help themselves. Problem is not in the Bible. All right. <laughs> Why do you think the unsaved love quoting this verse? I think probably because they feel so judged at times. And I'm sorry to say, very often it's judged by Christians, by, by you and me. And so they'll quote that verse, but they won't necessarily use the whole verse. They'll just say, don't judge me. <laughs> and so what they're saying is, you know, you have no right to, to, to tell me what I can or what I can't do. Do you know judging is, is probably one of the enemy's favorite tools that he uses to bring division? It shouldn't really surprise us because, because when somebody is judgmental or critical, you could also say they, they, they're negative toward that other person. They, they're almost looking down upon that other person. Now put yourself in their shoes. How do you feel? When there's somebody who's looking down at you, or at least that it's perceived, and, and, and you feel that they're actually a bit negative and a bit critical toward you, do, do you feel uh, closer to them, drawn to them? Nah, quite the opposite. You know, you, you, you don't want anything to do with somebody like that. And so it, it brings division. And so that's what the enemy does through, through judging. He, he brings division. So... What if I said to you, there's something that you and I could do that could maybe reach the unsaved in a greater way? Would you be open to that? Say, absolutely. If there's anything I can do to make it easier to reach the unsaved, absolutely. Well, here it is. Don't judge. Don't judge. Because do you know the number one thing that puts the unsaved off Christianity the number one thing that drives them away from Jesus and away from the church and away from you and me is judgmental Christians when they, when they sense they, they're being judged. And so we've got to get this thing right. And, and it's not only for our interaction with the unsaved. I'm going to show you that even our interaction with the people in our homes and families and the workplace and, Everybody around us, we've got to get this right. Now, of course, of course, we all have an opinion about someone or, or something, all right? It's not wrong to have an opinion. But just because we have an opinion doesn't mean we've got to express it, okay? That's what it's about at the end of the day. And for those of us, and that's me, with the stronger personality types, we've got to work on this thing a little bit harder. Because for the stronger personality types, you know, we, we think it's our right. You know, we've got to express our opinion. <laughs> and so I'm telling you, I've been working on this thing. And I'm here today to say to you, I haven't arrived. All right. <laughs> I'm still working. Lord, help me with this thing. It's difficult. And so, you know, you, you, listen, if you're like me, you may look at somebody else and say, you know, I would never do that fun. I'd never wear that. <laughs> I'd never drive that. I wouldn't have bought that. It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> but let them do what they want to do, all right? God has made us different, and we've got to make, make allowances for that. And you know, isn't it interesting how sometimes we will judge people's motives? So in other words, we're judging what's happening in their hearts, as if we can see in their hearts. And so we look at somebody and we'll say, oh, you know, she's just doing that to get closer to the boss. Or he's just doing that to get brownie points. What are we doing? We're judging their motives. And we may be right. 
and we may be wrong. The Bible says, don't judge, don't go there. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 7. Now, chapter 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. This is where Jesus just gives us some very, very practical advice for everyday living. He talks about marriage and divorce, and he talks about murder. I don't know how those go together, but in any case, <laughs> so he talks about these things. And then, and then in chapter 7, he gets to this topic of, of not judging. And, and, and he says this, he says, do not judge others or you will be judged. Those are uh, red letter words, if we can call it that, red letter words. Those are Jesus' own words. Now, why did Jesus tell his audience not to judge? Because clearly it was a problem back then. Not a problem today. We, we don't battle with this at all. You know, we just walk around saying, you know, I can't believe she's wearing that. Or, you know, did you hear what so-and-so did? Or, you know, he's only doing that to be seen. <laughs> Listen, I think, I think we've all been guilty of that at some, some stage. All right. And that's why Jesus says to us, he says, do not judge. Now, the word that Jesus uses there in, in judging basically means to discriminate or to offer criticism that's unfair or unjust. And so what he's saying is do not discriminate. Don't. I don't want you to discriminate. And I don't want you to be critical to the people around about you. And then he carries on in verse 2 and he says, for you will be treated. It's a warning. He says, you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And so what he's saying is if you're unfair, people are going to be unfair toward you. If you're critical, you're going to find people are going to be critical. You live by the sword. He says you're going to die by the sword. And, and I'm sure you've experienced this. Just think about somebody in your family or friendship group Somebody who's very critical and fault-finding, and they, they're always picking on others and, and so on. If they do something wrong, what happens? Man, everybody wants to crucify them, you know? But, but now think of somebody else who's gracious and kind. I, I did a funeral the other day for a lady in her 90s. And, and, and the, the testimonies again and again, the tributes were just, she was so gracious. She was so kind. Now think about somebody like that. If they do something wrong, everybody going to be on their case? No, not at all. Everybody is gracious toward them. And so that's why Jesus is saying, you will be treated as you treat others. Now we get to this well-known verse in verse 3 where he says, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye? When you have a log in your own, he says, how can you think of saying to your friend? He says, what are you thinking? Let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye. When you can't see past the log in your own, then he uses a strong word. He says, hypocrite. He says, you're a hypocrite, man. He says, first get rid of the log in your eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And so what Jesus is saying, he says, you want to be one of my disciples. You want to follow me. Because remember now, he's busy with the Sermon on the Mount. He's busy telling them how to live a practical Christian life. He says, you want to follow me. He says, you've got to be the least judgmental of all. <laughs> Isn't it strange how we as Christians are sometimes the most judgmental? Why is that? I mean, it, it shouldn't be, but yet it is. I think so many Christians see themselves as better than the unsaved. See them as see themselves as, as holier than thou. You know, I, I can't believe they're doing that. What kind of testimony is that? Or they'll say, did, did you see what she posted? And she calls herself a Christian. She actually goes to church. And, and so what are we doing? We're looking down upon them. We're seeing ourselves as, as, as better than them. Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't go there. Mind your own business. You know, I had somebody say to me some time ago, he was referring to somebody else. He says, you know, that guy's a problem. <laughs> I was like, what? Why? Have you seen how often he changes his cars? <laughs> 
for a guy, that's not a problem. There's just something wrong with you. And without thinking, I'm telling you, sometimes I say stuff without thinking. I know you guys don't, but I do sometimes. And so without thinking, I said to him, just like you changing your watches, because he has a watch collection. You see, it's relative, isn't it? And we're so quick to point to somebody else, and we don't even realize what's happening. I said to him, you have no idea the good that that guy does. I know of some of it. You have no idea how many people he helps. I know some of them. But yet we're so quick to point fingers and, 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 to, and to judge others just because we see a part of their lives. But we don't see the whole picture. We don't really know what's happening. Let's not do that. Let's not go there. And you know what I found in church world? And, and I don't know why, but this is even worse in, in church. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. In church world, we don't have to worry about Satan taking out church leaders or pastors because we'll do it for him. We, we'll just, don't, don't worry, we'll do it. <laughs> I cringe when I look at social media sometimes. And I see how Christians, not the unsaved, how Christians criticize church leaders and pastors just because they're doing stuff a little bit different. And so if it's not Joel Osteen, then it's Joyce Meyer. If it's not Joyce Meyer, then it's Stephen Furtick or somebody like that. And, 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 and you'll see comments like, ah, they're from the devil and they're not preaching a pure gospel and this and that. But yet they're reaching thousands, if not millions for Christ. And so I want to say to them, okay, big mouth, how many are you reaching? Can't even reach your neighbor. <laughs> but yet we're quick to criticize. The Bible says, touch not the Lord's anointed. Don't go there. I think God's big enough to deal with that himself. Okay? So if God thinks one of his pastors, one of his leaders messing up, He'll sort them out quickly if, if he needs be, all right? You and I don't have to. And so, so I just, I want to make a suggestion this morning. Let's be for those who are for Jesus. Can we do that? Let's be for those who are for Jesus. Even though they may be a little bit different. And even though some of them are a little bit weird. But it's okay. It's okay, Lord. You know, let, let's be for those who are for Jesus. I think that's important. Now, why did I say right in the beginning that this, this specific verse in Matthew chapter 1, judge not or you two will be judged. Why did I say this is probably one of the most misinterpreted verses? Because on the one hand, it says, don't go there. Don't do it. But then there's this other verse here in John chapter 7 that says, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Like, What? Which one is it now? Don't judge. Be careful. But judge correctly. Like, now what do you want me to do? <laughs> or is there a correct way to judge and an incorrect way to judge? Absolutely. The incorrect way, the Bible says, don't judge by appearances. What you think. He says, be careful of that. That's the incorrect way. And I think we've all done that again. At some stage, we judge by appearance. We judge the book by the cover. You take one look at somebody, you've already decided whether you like them or not. Well, why don't you like them? Nah, I don't know. Well, what's wrong with them? Nah, they, nah, they too full of themselves. Too, too, too arrogant. Too loud, you know. Too fat. Too thin. <laughs> and you know the crazy part. Listen to this. Then in a week's time, they get to know that person. And then they come back and they say, you know, they're actually pretty, pretty good people, you know. They're actually quite nice. You hypocrite. Just now you told me you don't like them. Now, now you're trying to convince me of how cool they are. <laughs> but we've all done that at some stage. And so that's the incorrect way to, to judge others. But then there's a correct way because judging is not always wrong. It's not always bad. There's a, there's a, there's a good side to it as well. And, and so uh, to judge also means to objectively evaluate someone, 
to objectively evaluate. So let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say you, you're wanting to employ somebody. What do you do? You call them in for an interview. And then you objectively evaluate them. Or you judge them. You judge them. We do exactly the same when we've got to employ somebody. And if it's somebody on a leadership level, I'm telling you, there's a lot of judging that goes on. I'm just telling you, all right. There's a lot of objectively evaluating. And Paul actually tells us to do this in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And he gives us quite a number of criteria. He says, these are some of the things that you've got to look for. You've got to check. Are they self-controlled? Do they have a good reputation? Are they, do they gladly open their homes to people? So in other words, are they hospitable? Are they, are, are they gentle? Are they quarrelsome? Because he says, if, if you want to put somebody in leadership, they cannot be quarrelsome. Always trying to pick a fight. You know, you just don't go for those kind of people. And then he says, and, and make sure, by the way, that they can manage their family well. In verse 5, he says, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? How can he even manage God's church? So you say, but, 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 but Paul, hang on. How do I know if they're managing their own family well? Do I need to judge them? Have you judged them? <laughs> he says, yes, absolutely. I've judged them for the purpose of leadership. That's the correct way to judge so it's not actually called judgment, it's called discerning. You want to discern whether they whether they right for that, that position or not. The, the Bible also tells us to judge those who cause division. Listen to this, Romans 16, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions. So he says, you, you've got to watch. How am I going to know? Do you want me to judge them? Absolutely. And then he says, as he says, he says, if you mature, you'll be able to discern between good and evil. Let me read it to you here in Hebrews 5. He says, but solid food, where do we get solid food? Right here in the word. Solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And so what he's saying is when you mature, you'll be able to distinguish, to judge between good and evil. Give you one last example quickly. Let's say somebody hurts you. They, they talk behind your back and, and there's a bit of tension in the relationship. What do you do? Do you just leave it? He says, no. He says, go and sort it out. But if I go and sort it out, then it's going to seem like I've, I've judged them. They've done something wrong. He says, you better go and do it. Now listen to this. He says, if your brother sins against you, all right, he's not referring to sisters because I think the sisters behave themselves, you know. <laughs> sisters will never talk out of, out of place or if they don't talk much, it's the brothers that mess up. All right, man, I'm, I must come talk to Jesus. Jesus, are you sure you wanted to say brothers? <laughs> if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault and if he listens to you, because guys are great listeners. You, you've won your brother over. All right. But if he will not listen. Oh, you know. Okay. There are times where they don't listen. He says, take, all, take one or two others along with you to beat him up so that he will listen properly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so judging, according to the Bible, is not always a negative. It's not always a bad thing. If it's done in the right way, the right time, by the right people. All right? So there's a, there's a good way and a correct way to judge. But I think, I think sometimes it's just, you know, we just, we just judge people according to our standard. We look down upon them according to, to, to our standard because they don't quite meet our standard. And so we think because, because we do this, they don't do that, they're wrong, we're right. But you see, what we've got to realize is we're all in different stages of our race. 
We're in a different place. God is busy with a different thing in our lives. And so God may be working in my life in a certain area. I may be further along in this area. But that person, God's busy working in another area in their lives. And so we've got to make room for that. You see, we look at it from our perspective, from our preference, and, and, and we, 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 we overlook God's purposes. It's so easy for us to, to elevate our preference above His purpose. Our preference above his purpose. He's got a purpose. He's busy doing. Oh, but you should be sorting them out. God says, hey, I'm busy. With, leave them up to me. Let, let me. let me handle them. You just focus on your race and you do what, what you're busy doing. And so we, we've got to learn to back off with these things. You know, sometimes here's another way we judge. We, we, we judge somebody else's weakness according to our strength. And so if, if we're very organized, it's easy for us to see those who are disorganized. And we look at them and we say, man, this, and you're probably married to one of those. <laughs> All right? Because typically in, in, in a marriage, you will have, typically you will have a, an organized and a disorganized one. You will have a disciplined one and one that's a little less disciplined, just a little all right? And so it's easy for us if, if, we, if we disciplined in areas to look at somebody else and to, and, and to look down upon them and, and, and to think that's wrong. Or if we generous, you see somebody else who's not as generous and you see them as, as just stingy and tight-fisted and, and so on. But, but, but you see, what are we doing? We're comparing our strength to their weakness and we forget they've got strengths where we have weaknesses. <sighs> so this is an interesting verse, very interesting verse. On the one hand, he says, judge. On the other hand, he says, don't go there. <laughs> and to understand it correctly, to understand it just a bit better, we've always got to look at the context. What is the context? Now, we're looking at, at Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. So to look at it in context, we've got to go back a little bit to chapter 6. Now, if you go and have a look at chapter 6, you'll find that Jesus is actually busy addressing the Pharisees, and he's busy addressing hypocrisy. And you can see this in verse 2, verse 5, verse 16. He's busy addressing hypocrisy all the time. He says, don't do that, don't do that. And, and then in, in chapter 7, verse 1, he says, now don't judge. In, in verse 5, he says, remember, it's the part where, where he talks about the speck and the log. And, so, and again, he says, you hypocrite, don't do that. So the whole train of, of teaching is all about hypocrisy. And then he comes later on in verse 7, and, and, and he says, beware of false prophets. He said, but whoa, whoa, now hang on, what must I do? You know, I'm not, I'm not getting this thing. You're telling me, don't judge. And then you say, judge. You must check if they if they false, if they're good or if they're bad. How am I going to know if they're good or bad if, if I haven't judged? He says, you've got to discern. You've got to discern. You see, the problem is not with discernment. The problem, what he's addressing is hypocrisy. And so if we can see those two, if we can understand it like that, it helps us. It's, it, he tells us you've got to discern between good and evil, the right fit for your company or for the position or not. You've got to be able to discern. But he says be careful of just being judgmental and critical and, 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 and so on. That's what we've got to be careful of. Now listen to what he says here in Romans chapter 2. Paul says, he says, you may think you can condemn such people. Who's he referring to? Sinners, all right? He says, he says you're saved, you're serving God, you're not doing those things, and so now you think you can condemn them? He says, but you are just as bad, and, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and, and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same thing. You know what he's basically saying here? He's saying you too are a Christian. 
You too fail at times. You mess up at times. You're not perfect. And so he's saying, be careful. Why is it that we do this? That we accuse others and then we excuse ourselves. Isn't it? We, we so easily do this. We accuse them. We point fingers toward them. And then we excuse ourselves. We, 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 we make excuses. We have reasons. Oh, well, it was only that one time. I don't normally do that, you know. Or I don't normally use that kind of language. Or, you know, I didn't really mean to say that. Or, you know, you, we may say, if you knew my background, you knew how I grew up, you would understand. And so what are we doing? We're excusing ourselves while we keep on accusing others. Jesus says, don't do that. You know what I found? Our harshest judgment often reveals our greatest weakness. Can I say that again? Our harshest judgment often reveals our greatest weakness. And so if you see somebody constantly pointing a finger, constantly judging others, there's a good chance they're battling in that same area. And so I knew a guy that had an issue with young people coming to church and they're living together and they're going to cell groups and you're allowing them to come to church. I said to him, well, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to put up a sign outside, no sinners allowed? Because if I had to do that, you would be the last one in the building. I didn't say that. <laughs> Again, I was so tempted, eh? but I didn't, I, you know. If we had to do that, we wouldn't have people in this building, nor would I be here. Yeah, well then what, you know, how are you, how are you handling it? So I said, this is the principle. This is how we operate. And the principle, this principle, I find in Scripture. Belonging, then believing, then behaving. I see that principle in Scripture. I see Jesus t uh, uh, treating people like that. Think about Zacchaeus. He, he shows acceptance. He allows him to come in, to come closer, to, to belong. He doesn't say to Zacchaeus, now sort yourself out before you even out that tree, and then I'll consider coming to your home. He says, no, I'll come to your home. Then he goes, and, and so what, is, what happens? Zacchaeus experiences belonging. The same with the lady at the well. The same with Mary who comes to anoint his feet and wash his feet with her tears and then anoint it with oil. Same thing, acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. And then while they're sitting here, week after week, they start, start believing because they start realizing this lifestyle that we're leading is not right. So some people can think they can come to this church and we condone their behavior. Oh, no, we don't. And if they had to ask me, I'll tell them straight. We don't condone, and we're going to try and help you out of that, that lifestyle. And so it's belonging, then believing, and then what happens? Behaving. Then they come and they say, would you marry us? Oh, absolutely. We've been waiting for you to ask. <laughs> and now what's happening? Nobody pushed them into marriage. Nobody bullied them or forced them or anything like that. It's a conviction they want to get married. And so I explained this to this guy. Ah, oh, he's got a problem, you know. He's just, he's just one of those very uh, self-righteous, religious kind of people. And so it turned out, turned out, he was busy having an affair with his secretary at work. And so I found very often, our harshest judgment often reveals our greatest weakness. Be careful. Be careful. Let's lean toward grace. Let's lean toward grace. It doesn't mean we accept sin and we condone it. We don't at all. But we love the people and we want to try and help them out of their sin. And so isn't this exactly what God has done for us? God's been gracious to us and very patient. And so Paul reminds us of God's grace here in Romans chapter 2. Here's the last scripture for this morning. Paul says to us, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? 
Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Another translation says it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Not God's judgment, not God's condemnation upon us, but his goodness. And because God is so good to us, we want to change. And so that's the kind of attitude and that's the kind of heart that I believe God wants us to have toward other people, saved or unsaved. So instead of walking around being judgmental and critical and looking down upon them and finding fault, let's turn away from that. Let's be gracious and kind and forgiving. Like this little old lady I, I, I buried the other day where everybody just said the same thing. And I was standing there thinking, Leonard, if this is your funeral, would they be able to say that of you? Because that was who she was. She didn't do that once or twice. She lived that. And my prayer today is that you and I will live that way. Amen? Come on, let's stand. Let me share one, one last thought with you quickly. You know what I found? When it comes to being judgmental, you know, we want to, we want to zip it. All right, I better not say anything. Just, just zip it. And that's a good start. But you know where it really starts? Is here in the heart. Is what we think. Because we can zip it and we can zip it but somewhere along the line, it's going to come out. Because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we, we're going to say the wrong thing at, at some stage. We're just postponing it. But if we can correct the heart, it's not going to come out. And so I've tried, you know, when I have critical thoughts, when I have negative thoughts, just change that and just say, you know what? That's between them and the Lord. I may not have uh, done that, but, but, but it's okay. I, I don't know what's happening in their lives. Come, let's pray. Father, thank you that you've been gracious and kind toward us. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. You've been good to us. And we pray this morning, we ask that you'll help us to have that heart and that attitude toward other people, whether we agree with them or not, but that we will not have a judgmental attitude. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you.